So in the first module, um, in our first week, we talked some, uh, quite a bit about sound as a phenomena, as sound, in other words, um, as something in our heads, as something that we experience and can describe. And in this module, we're shifting instead to talking about sound as a signal. That is to say, sound as something objective and often um, as something physical. Um, so if I click here on Reaper and I, I have in front of me the sound signal that we were listening to in our first week, that Gotan track, what we're looking at is a very stereotypical visualization of sound as a signal. And if I zoom in on some random spot here, here I am getting closer and closer and closer. We can use this to learn some basic things about sound as a signal. So one of the things about a signal uh, in general is that it's something that varies in time. And in this conventional visualization in Reaper, time goes from left to right. And sure enough, we, to, we see two squiggly lines that are going up and down as we go from left to right. So we have two positions that are changing. And the two lines here represent two sound signals, one for the left speaker or the left headphone, and one for the right speaker or, or right headphone. So that's one characteristic of signals. There's a, a signal, and sound as a signal is something that varies in time. Um, a second characteristic, if we pay close attention and look at this Gotan sound signal, even if we zoom in some more, is that it's basically a continuous signal, right? Like it's not jumping instantaneously from one place to another. Instead, what we see are kind of smooth curves. What we see in the next moment is something that is moved some distance away in a smooth way from what was there before. So our sound signals are not just signals, they're continuous signals. And there's a third thing we can notice about these sound signals if we pay close attention. And that's that these signals are bipolar. And what I mean by that is that they are not going just up and down on top of some base, can, base level, and they're not just going down below some starting level. Rather, they're going up and down below a middle point that's like a resting position. So if we zoom out again on this whole Gotan waveform, we see lots of motion there around that midpoint. And we might expect that if we were to kind of take the average position of all these signals, that it would just be, it would be the midpoint. It would be right in the middle. And indeed, that would be true for this signal. Um, so we've learned sort of three things here about sound as signals. Um, and I'm going to put them in some notes over here. We've seen that a signal is something that varies in time. We've seen that when we um, treat sound as a signal, that it's a continuous signal. In other words, no um, completely immediate jumps. And a third and really important thing was that it's a bipolar signal. In other words, that it varies um, in both directions around a rest position. So this thing about sound signals being bipolar is really closely related to um, the way sound exists physically in the world and to the types of devices that we use to represent sound and to produce sound. Uh, I always think of the loudspeaker, first of all. Uh, the loudspeaker has a, a cone that's pushed by a magnet, and when, and when no electricity is pushing that electromagnet, the cone just kind of sits in the middle. But when you um, apply a positive voltage, the cone moves forward. When you apply a negative voltage, the cone moves back. So you see that the speaker, the loudspeaker in its design, is meant to um, uh, reproduce these bipolar signals. Similarly, our eardrum. Our eardrum is basically a very thin piece of skin, um, continuous with the rest of the skin on our body, but inside of our eardrum, uh, inside of our ear canal. Um, 
And if we were to somehow magically place ourselves in a situation where no, no air motion was happening, it would just sit um, perfectly still. Um, but what happens is that there is air motion. Sometimes the air pressure is a little higher. Sometimes the air pressures are a little lower. And that pushes that air drum either backwards or forwards um, into or out of our head. So the eardrum, too, is something that's capable of carrying these bipolar signals. We could come up with more examples uh, as well. In fact, we've already mentioned one. When we have an electrical signal, a voltage in a wire, it could be positive or it could be negative. And again, that's something that is bipolar. So when we talk about sound as a signal, to reiterate, we're talking about treating sound as something that varies continuously in time and that does this in a bipolar way. It goes up and down around some kind of rest position. Now if I go back to Reaper, the rest position is, this, is marked by this very faint white line in the middle of the two signals here. Now we can make another observation about this representation of sound in Reaper, which is that um, there's a rest position, but not only is there a rest position, there's a maximum. And that's represented right here. And it's not represented very well in the middle, but actually there would be a corresponding maximum for this signal in the bottom here. And then this signal too, they don't represent its upper maximum very well, but there would also be um, um, an, a, a lowest possible position or an anti-maximum here as well. So our conventional visualization of a sound signal here in Reaper reflects another characteristic typically of sound signals, which is that the things that make sound, the things that store sound, typically have some kind of maximum point. Like your sound signal can't go beyond that maximum point or bad things happen. So we're going to talk a little bit more in a second about the bad things um, that can happen with that. Um, but one thing that can happen is that we lose the information from that event. So imagine that we have a loudspeaker and we give it a signal that would push the loudspeaker cone too far forward, further forward than, than it can go physically. Um, if we tried to do that, it wouldn't work. And as a result, we would hear something different um, than what that producer or artist or than what that wasn't what than what was intended by that document. Similarly, in um, a recording situation, if we have some kind of electronics that are sensing um, sound levels and we give them levels that are too high for them to measure, they're going to give us um, lower levels. They're going to give us the maximum level instead. We're not going to ever know about what sort of really happened when those levels went too high. Um, and then when we play it back, we're going to hear something quite different than what we thought we recorded. So this is really one of the two big problems that we are learning to deal with in the first part of this course. This is the problem of clipping. And what clipping is, is um, when a signal goes beyond some maximum, and so um, doesn't actually go beyond that maximum. And when you, um, it's really a problem in recording. When you, ha when you record something and it clips, what happens is that you get a signal that doesn't represent what really happened. And when you play it back, when you listen to this signal, it will have lots of extra high frequency components added to it. Um, and this phenomena is also called distortion. And we'll do some ear training around this, and probably in the, the next week, um, we'll do some experiments that will investigate this in a little bit more detail. But the important thing um, to, to know at this point about clipping is that once our signal has been changed so that it's stuck at that maximum, we're never going to get back what actually happened. So for this reason, clipping in recording 
is an absolute disaster. We want to avoid clipping at all costs. So that's, I said that clipping is one of the big problems we're learning to avoid here. The second big problem that we're learning to avoid is the problem of noise. Um, noise takes many forms, um, but for our purposes, in the first part of this course, we'll treat noise as undesired signals. So right now, I'm, my voice is being recorded by a microphone, and other faint little background noises are also um, going into the microphone, and they're being converted into electricity, and that electrical voltage is being measured and turned into numbers, which are being um, stored as a file on the computer. And the microphone um, doesn't know where those fluctuations are coming from. It has no way of distinguishing between fluctuations that are due to my voice or fluctuations that are due to the background noise or fluctuations that are due to the air conditioner. All of those fluctuations, they all get mixed together and they arrive at the microphone you know, as some kind of sound signal, as some kind of vibration around a rest position. That's it. And whatever shape we get, that's what gets recorded. So your noises, your undesired signals, and your desired signals, like my voice in this case, they're always mixed together. Um, they're always mixed together in the air, and they're always mixed together when they get converted to electricity by the microphone. They're always mixed together in the numbers that you then get in your digital files. Um, if, th if they're strongly present in the numbers that you get, um, then they are maybe going to mask the desired sounds that you want. They're going to be so loud that they're going to get in the way of you hearing the desired sounds that you want. If they are there, if the, if the undesired sounds, the noises are there, but they're there much, much, much more quietly, then that's not going to be a problem. So a really basic point we can make about noise or undesired signals in our recordings is that noise is a fact of life. There are lots of different sources of noise. We cannot produce a recording that has no noise in it. But what we can do is do things to make the presence of noise less noticeable in the recording, perhaps even so much less noticeable that no human ear um, could hear it. So we have these two problems. Clipping, problem number one is clipping, which is that our signals can go beyond some maximum, and then we, um, we lose information and we get the sound of distortion. And problem number two is noise. In other words, the problem that um, our signals are generally mixes of what we want and other things that we don't want. So our focus today, talking about sound as signal, um, the things that we're talking about theoretically, they're things that we can apply, that we will apply in simple ways and later in more complicated ways to these two problems, the problem of clipping and noise. So I want to come back to those problems at the end of this video lecture. And I want to turn now to, um, to a unit of measurement that is really useful when talking about sound as a signal. And that's the unit known as the decibel, which is abbreviated dB, or dB with a capital B, or perhaps other variations on that. So if I back up here, um, decibels are a unit that express relative size in linear terms. This is the unit decibels in general. And in a second, we're going to shift to talking about the way decibels are used in audio conversations, in audio software, that kind of thing. Um, so it's, it's actually easiest to just talk about the examples. Um, if we take something and we make it 50% of what it was before, if we re reduce it to being only 50% of what it was before, we can express that same idea by saying... Um, that we make the thing six decibels smaller, or that we apply minus six decibels to the thing. Conversely, if we make something 
twice as big, we can call that adding six decibels. So, you know, something to realize here in these first two examples we've talked about, in both cases, what's on the left side here is kind of multiplying or dividing something, right? We're making it half as big or making it twice as big. But what we have over here is being expressed as addition or subtraction. So this is really good if you have something like an audio signal where we're sensitive to a really broad range of differences. Speaking very roughly, the size of the loudest thing we might want to hear versus the, the quietest thing that we can hear, oversimplifying a lot, the difference between these two things might be a factor of a million to one. So there's a lot of potential um, gradations, a lot of differences there. Decibels make it easy to talk about this very wide range of decibels in ways that closely relate to how our perception um, of these things seems to work. So um, let's look at a few more of the examples because it helps to understand the unit. Um, every time we double something, it's an increase of six decibels. So if instead we make something four times as big, or 400%, that's like doubling something twice. And so the way to talk about that in decibels would be that it would be 12 decibels more, plus 12 decibels. And if we were to make something eight times as big, that's like doubling something three times. Two times two is four, times two is eight. And so that's like adding six decibels three times to get 18 decibels. So um, the last example here, if we have n none of something, 0%, um, the only way we can express that in decibels is minus infinity decibels. Because any um, amount in decibels that is greater than minus infinity is always going to be something that reduces something but still leaves something left somehow. So that's decibels in general. Um, in the kind of, um, that's about as much of the math of decibels as I think you need to know for this course. But if you're really curious, there is a more technical formula for decibels um, that would help you figure out sort of every equivalency of a number in decibels to a change of size. But what I'm showing on this chart here, I think is really the kind of rule of thumb um, level of understanding of decibels that most audio people have with them in their everyday work. So um, the next slide here talks about two applications of decibels to the world of audio. Decibels SPL and decibels full scale. So, um, so let's talk about each of them in turn. So over here on the left, we have a chart that says has some information on it about decibels SPL. And the thing that we really need to remember about um, decibels SPL, it's kind of hidden by this annoying um, um, toolbar here. Maybe I can get rid of it by full screening. Not really. Oh, I can get rid of it by just not moving the mouse. There we go. So at the bottom of the screen, um, that little fact you see there in the bottom left, zero decibels of SPL, threshold of silence. That's the key piece to remember about decibels SPL. Decibels SPL is a system of talking about sound levels where um, zero decibels refers to the quietest thing a supposedly average person can hear in the acoustic world. And then everything um, else, all the other measurements in decibels SPL, are going to be above that if we can hear the thing. Um, and so, um, you know, the next thing, if we look up there, the quiet dishwasher. 44 decibels SPL. So that's how much louder um, the quiet dishwasher is than the quietest thing um, that we can hear. And then there's a kind of range here from 50 to 80 or so where we're talking about the kinds of levels of air pressure fluctuations that we get in healthy, safe, normal, everyday situations. Um, so Maybe in our next lecture we'll do some measurements of this with a sound pressure level meter. And then from 80 to 120, we're in a zone where um, the more time, the higher the level 
is, the sooner it is for us, for our hearing to undergo immediate damage. So if you look in the legislation, in particular jurisdictions, like in Canada or in Hamilton or Ontario, noise, noise pollution legislation and also work safety legislation, you'll find lots of figures in this 80 to 120 range um, because it's in society's interest to protect people um, from environments that damage their hearing. At 120 decibels SPL, at, at that level of um, sound pressure fluctuation, damage is imagined to occur immediately to, um, to our biological hearing system. The final figure that we often remember about decibels SPL is this one at the top here. 130 decibels SPL. That's the threshold of immediate pain. Um, and there's a kind of um, interesting and I think cautionary observation to be made here, which is that in terms of decibels SPL, the threshold of immediate pain is higher than the threshold of immediate damage, which means that we can be suffering immediate damage to our hearing from high sound pressure level before we're experiencing immediate pain from the sound pressure level. Um, so we have to be careful um, with our hearing. It's possible to damage it without realizing that we're doing so. So decibels SPL, um, to recap a little bit, is a, a, a unit for measuring the size of sound signals where zero decibels represents the quietest sound we can hear and the values go up from that. And it's a unit that is used um, typically in measurements of actual sound environments. Um, so it's a measurement of sound as vibrating air pressure. So now let's talk about decibels full scale. So decibels full scale is a unit that is used to describe sound signals as they exist in software. So if we were to go back to Reaper, and look in some places. I'm going to play a little bit. There's various places where we see some numbers here down in the bottom left. Um, and there's also some, some numbers on these meters here. All of these numbers um, are in decibels full scale. So the way decibels full scale works is it's a, a unit for measuring the size of audio signals where zero decibels is the digital maximum. In other words, if I go back to Reaper, zero decibels would be this top line here or the bottom line that they have chosen not to draw right here, the, the two maximum positions for that signal after which it clips. Those are called zero decibels full scale. And so that means that if we go above zero decibel full scale, if we're increasing the level of the thing somehow, we must be clipping. And that's probably going to be a problem. And the other thing that it means is zero decibels is our maximum. It means that all of the things that we're going to be interested in are going to be below zero decibels full scale. In other words, they're going to be negative values. So one thing um, that we may have discovered in our first exercises with the inner ear ear training software is that when we move the threshold of that exercise down to progressively lower negative values, there was probably some point where we couldn't really tell anymore whether or not there was a sound there or not. Um, and that's shown here on the slide. Somewhere between minus 60 and minus 120 are the typical thresholds of hearing under real world conditions depending on how quiet your listening environment is, depending on what other noises there are, um, you at cer a certain point, um, things that are so far below the digital maximum are probably going to become inaudible to us. And if we have something that is just a flat line at the middle, um, at the rest position, just right along this white line here, not moving at all, that would be zero in absolute terms, and in decibels it would be minus infinity. So the last thing I want to say about this slide before moving on, talking about these two units of decibels, is that we kind of see a relationship between them, they're, because they're both 
they're both related to human hearing. Decibels SPL are about measurements of sound in the world. And on our chart here, we see a range of about 120 decibels from the quietest sound we can hear to the thing that's going to cause immediate damage to us. So about 120 decibels. And similarly, with the unit decibels full scale, we see a range of about 120 de decibels. Usually our files are going to have levels that are very close to zero, the digital maximum, and probably the quietest components of them are going to be down more around minus 120. Um, so some examples of decibels full scale here on a, on a kind of artist rendition of a waveform like we might see in Reaper. Uh, and this is um, really useful just for um, reinforcing some of the concepts we've already talked about in this lecture. Let's say we have a waveform that moves like this and it goes all the way to the maximum there. That maximum is zero decibels full scale. Now let's say we have another waveform and we're comparing these two waveforms and let's say this one only goes to the halfway point. I know that's not exactly the halfway point, but bear with me. Let's call it the halfway point. Well, that's 50% as large as this one. If we want to talk about that in decibels, it's going to be six decibels lower, or minus six decibels full scale. Um, sound signals are bipolar, like we said. Let's say we look at this waveform down here, under the rest position. Well, it's also half as big, like it goes half as far away from the rest position as this one does. So it's at minus six decibels full scale um, as well. Uh, we could say that it peaks at minus six decibels full scale. In other words, the part of it that is the furthest away from the rest position is half as much away from the rest position as the maximum is. Well, just continuing the example, this last one, let's say that this one is both of the, both of the sides of this are half as big as this one, so they're going to be another six decibels lower. Um, so a point I want to make about this slide is that for a visualization of a waveform, this is pretty big, right? Like if we were working in Reaper and we had lots of different tracks, we, we may not, might not be looking um, this zoomed in on the waveform even. And yet we can see that when we draw it, even this small one is still at minus 12 decibels full scale. A second ago, we saw that our range of human hearing was, you know, conservatively around minus 100, around 120 decibels. And so you can see that as these levels keep going down, it's going to be very hard to visualize those levels there. And that's a really um, um, important insight for practical work with sound. Um, you may sometimes be tempted into thinking that you can see what's going on um, with the sound. And I think what we see here, and from our discussion of decibels, you can see that, that that is often really not the case. Once we get down to minus 20 or minus 30 decibels, it's all going to kind of look the same. It's going to look like a little squiggly line really close to the center line, and everything is going to look exactly the same. And yet, when you listen to that, you'll hear tons of stuff going on. And so, you know, the practical insight that comes out of that is that when we're doing audio work, we really have to distrust our eyes and we have to distrust what the software shows us. Um, the software is really useful for um, positioning ourselves in time, like telling the software where to start and when to stop. It really isn't very good at showing us what's there in the audio. We have to listen for that and we have to always remember to listen for that. All right, so we've talked about decibels SPL, we've talked about decibels full scale, and uh, we're getting closer to coming back to our clipping and noise problems that we talked about. And um, what we have here on this diagram is uh, a diagram of the chain of connections that happens when someone makes a recording with digital recording hardware. So in this first part of the course, you're going to do field recordings for a soundscape project. Um, for a phonography project, um, and you're going to use hardware um, like this Zoom H4n Handy Recorder, right? And um, the Handy Recorder is it's a great portable recorder. Like a lot of devices, um, it combines a lot of things in one. Um, 
And so what we need to talk about is to kind of tease apart some of the different parts of what is happening when you use this recorder in order to understand how to make recordings that avoid clipping uh, and, and perhaps also recordings that avoid um, noise. So if we're recording, um, we have a chain um, that looks something like this. There's going to be a sound source somewhere, uh, and it's going to be doing things that are making air molecules vibrate. And those vibrations travel through the air. Um, if at one point in the air the pressure is a little bit higher, in the next moment that higher air pressure is going to distribute to adjacent air molecules, and in that way you get waves that travel through the air, air pressure waves. So you have vibrating air molecules. And then those pressure waves eventually reach a microphone, let's say. And the microphone is a kind of transducer. In other words, it's something that converts one type of vibration into another type of vibration. Or if you want to say it a different way, it's something that converts one kind of signal into another kind of signal. So let's imagine that we have a signal of vibrating air. After the microphone, it will be a signal of vibrating electrical voltage. So after the microphone, um, we have a vibrating electrical voltage. And something that we don't necessarily um, realize right away we're using this heart, when, we, when we're plugging in and using microphones is that the very next thing that happens is that that little electrical signal from the microphone goes into an amplifier, usually called a preamplifier, that turns it from a small electrical signal into a larger electrical signal. And this amplifier is usually under our control. Um, so lots of recording devices will have something called like recording level or gain or perhaps other things. And really what those um, controls are referring to is how much amplifying this amplifier is doing. Um, after that amplifier, the slightly larger electrical voltage goes into a device called an analog to digital converter. And what that does is it takes the electrical voltage and it measures it, turns it into numbers that can be stored in files. Um, in the case of the H4N, they're stored in files that are on the device's um, SD card at first. Um, and in other digital recording situations, those files um, might go onto other media. And once those files exist as numbers, they're not going to change anymore. Um, they, are, they are what they are. Maybe they get used in um, other projects. They get used in our projects. They get transformed into new things that way. But the numbers themselves aren't going to change once they exist as files uh, in some form of digital media. So going back and looking at this chain, um, we can actually use this diagram and this chain to think about our two problems, clipping and noise. So um, let's talk about noise, first of all. The most important source of noise is probably other sound sources that are happening here. Um, you have a bunch of sound sources that are happening. Vibrating air from all of them is eventually reaching the microphone. Those vibrations get all added together. And from that, we get a single signal that we're kind of stuck with from that point on. So um, there's a, a law of physics, a law of acoustics, that's really useful to think about uh, in turn here. And that's called the inverse square law. Uh, but it's quite simple. Really what it says is that if we don't change anything, but we increase the distance that vibrating air has to travel, that a sound signal has to travel, um, we make it half as big. So if we, if we double the distance, the sound signal gets half as big. In other words, it goes down by six decibels. Conversely, if we have the distance, if we get closer, we make the sound source closer to the microphone, the, the level that it gives to the microphone increases. Um, if you make it half as close, then it goes up by six decibels. In other words, it doubles in size. So for noise, for undesired signals, this is our most powerful weapon. Because usually, not always, but usually, we have control over where our desired sounds are. Or, if you want to look at it this way, we have control over 
where we put our microphones in relationship to our desired sounds. So to make a long story short, if we put our microphone really close to the things that we want to record, we'll probably, we'll be making them larger in the signal while we'll probably not be changing the level of the other things that much. It all gets mixed together by the time it arrives at the microphone in the, in the situation where the microphone is closer to the desired sounds, we're going to get um, a signal that proportionately has more of the desired sounds in it. So this is um, really the principle of microphone proximity, the most important way of avoiding noise. Um, perhaps we should say controlling noise instead. And the inverse square law gives us uh, an objective numerical way of thinking about microphone proximity. We double the distance, things go down by minus six decibels. If we have the distance, things go up by six decibels. Um, so to give a, a concrete example of this, say that we have a singer who is a certain distance away from a microphone and we listen to the signal that we're getting and we say, well, we don't like um, how much background noise there is in, in that recording, in that signal. And now let's say that we ask the singer to be four times as close to the microphone. Well, the inverse square law tells us that that's going to increase the level of air pressure arriving at the microphone from that singer by 12 decibels. In other words, the level of the singer is going to be now 12 decibels higher than it was relative to the noise previously. We're going to get a recording where the desired parts now have a are even further over the level of the undesired parts. So microphone proximity, our most important tool um, for controlling noise. Um, we're going to learn other tools for controlling noise, but nothing that we learn about those other tools is going to change the fact that microphone proximity is the most powerful way of controlling noise in recordings. Um, if we go back to our chain here, our microphone converts that vibrating air into electricity, which goes into the preamplifier, and from there it goes into the analog to digital converter. Now the analog to digital converter, converting that electricity into numbers, it has a maximum. If you give it an electrical voltage that's above that maximum, it will just pretend that it's the maximum. So that is, you guessed it, clipping. Uh, and we don't want that for all the reasons that we talked about before. We don't, um, we lose information, it changes the sound, it introduces distortion. Clipping is a disaster, we have to avoid that. And that is why we have this preamplifier here and why Almost always, the preamplifier is something that we can control to make it make things bigger or make things smaller. The idea, the ideal, is that when the signal arriving at the microphone has the balance that you want between your desired things and your undesired things, now you adjust the gain control in order to make sure that the level that reaches the ADAC doesn't go above the maximum, that it doesn't clip. At the same time, you don't want the levels to be really, 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 really small. Um, this is something that we'll talk a little bit more about in module four, um, but for now, let's just say that if you make the levels really, 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 really small when they go into the analog to digital converter, you'll have all kinds of electrical and digital noises added to the signal, and it won't sound very good. So we need to make the signal that arrives at this last part of the chain, we need to make it not over the maximum, but not too far from the maximum either. And so we've arrived at our last important concept for, for today, which is the concept of headroom. And the idea of headroom is that when we're making a recording, we need to set the preamplifier gain in such a way that the signals that arrive at the analog to digital converter are close to the maximum, but not 
too close to the maximum. Um, how close to the maximum do we want them to be? Well, that depends on the situation. Um, and really, there's two main variables to consider. One is um, how unpredictable the sound levels are. If you're in a very unpredictable situation and someone could get louder at any moment or some loud thing could happen, you might want to leave more room, more headroom, so that if that unpredictable thing happens, you don't clip. Um, on the other hand, if you're dealing with something that's very, very predictable, you can look at the levels while testing and um, you know, sort of see exactly where they're going to go if you do the thing again, well then maybe you don't need as much headroom. So the unpredictability of the situation is one thing influencing how much headroom you need. Another thing, another variable, is how expensive it would be to redo the thing. And expensive could mean different things. It could mean um, uh, you know, the cost of paying for other people's time. It could mean um, it could mean the cost of your own time. It could mean people getting frustrated, avoiding a kind of so you know, like a social cost, avoiding frustration or something like that. Um, in the limit case, it could mean that something can't be re like something could have an infinite cost because it's something that can never be redone. So I don't know. Imagine that you are um, being paid to record some really important um, political event or something like that. You know, um, you know that's it's never going to happen again. It's 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 a one-time event. You get it or you don't get it. Um, well, that's very expensive. Is the way I would look at it. So maybe you want more headroom because of that. Um, we'll talk about this more, but often I start with 10 decibels as a kind of baseline level of headroom. And then if things are more expensive to redo, I increase the headroom. And if things are more unpredictable, I increase the headroom as well. Um, and so when we talk about 10 decibels of headroom, what we really mean is that before we record, we're going to um, look at the levels we're getting our hardware and our software always has meters that show the levels of the signal coming in. We're going to look at the levels we're getting and we're going to adjust the preamplifier up or down so that the levels are around 10 decibels below the maximum. So in other words, when we say I'm trying to have 10 decibels of headroom, another way of saying the same thing is that we're looking for test levels around minus 10, right? Because if you have test levels around minus 10, that's 10 decibels away from the maximum, which is 0 decibels full scale. If we go and look at our, um, our H4N here, on the front panel of it, when you, when you press record, the meters get activated. And whatever levels you're getting, you see them dancing here. And if we look really, really closely at the bottom of the meters here, it's a, you can see that it says 0 here and then minus 6, and then minus 12, and minus 24, and then further down it says minus 48. These numbers are in decibels full scale. So if I was doing a recording and with the H4N, and I wanted to have 10 decibels of headroom to protect against clipping, what I would do is before I do the actual recording is I would press record once to put it in standby, and then I would look at the meters, and I'd be if I was looking for 10 decibels of headroom, I'd be wanting the meters to occasionally go into this spot here in the middle between minus 12 and minus 6, around minus 10. If I was recording something that was more expensive or more unpredictable, maybe I decided I wanted 20 decibels of headroom, well then during testing I'd be looking for levels around here. And so I would increase or decrease the recording gain, there's a button on the side of the H4N that does that, until I was getting the level, uh, levels, I, the level of headroom that I was expecting. Then I'd say, okay, I'm ready, and now I can really do the recording. So an important thing to realize about this is that um, you don't set the level of headroom that you want. Like if you know that you need 10 decibels of headroom, you don't, um, you don't sort of set 10 decibels somewhere. Instead, you have to expose the recorder to the sounds, see the levels you're getting, and you just move up and down until you're getting levels in the zone that you want. Um, when we when we look to establish a certain amount of headroom, that's not like a setting that we do. It's, it's an adjustment to a setting in order to get a certain kind of result. 
Um, there is an infinite number of possible combinations of sounds and physical situations in the world, an infinite number of possible places you could be holding or um, where you could be placing the, the, the microphones that are um, picking up those sounds. Um, the recorder has no way of knowing what you are doing with it. It just knows the levels that are arriving at it. Um, so we've um, covered um, a lot of ground here. And um, um, we've come up with the basic answers to our two basic problems that we're dealing with in the first part of the course. Problem number one, clipping. When we're recording, we don't want signals to go beyond some maximum because that introduces a kind of distortion and we lose information. And for the problem of clipping, we have talked about the approach of headroom, which is that we, um, which is basically that we, um, before recording, we aim for target levels a bit below the maximum, and how much below depends on the circumstances, how unpredictable and how expensive it would be to redo those, um, redo those recordings. And problem number two is noise, or the presence in our signals of things that we don't want. And we saw that our big strategy for that is working with microphone proximity, um, because when we're closer to the things that we want to record, they're more present in our signals. So a key learning outcome in this first part of the course um, that this discussion is intended to kickstart is that when we do recordings, we're going to be managing both of these things, microphone proximity and headroom, in order to control noise while avoiding clipping. I hope this has been helpful. Please feel free to send any questions um, to my email address, ogbornd at mcmaster.ca and I'll, I'll be happy to give you um, prompt answers. Um, otherwise, um, do that online reading, do the online quiz before next Sunday, uh, and I will see you next week.